On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including AI lands on the moon, an extremely close call threatens to trigger a debris nightmare scenario in orbit, and Astrobotics Peregrine Lunar Lander finishes testing and prepares for launch. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the Space Race. The United Arab Emirates has sent their first robotic exploration vehicle into outer space. The Rashid rover is on a course for the moon as we speak. And not only is Rashid on a mission to hunt for new minerals and interesting geology, this rover will test out the first artificial intelligence algorithm on the moon. The Rashid was launched back in December 2022 aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, snugly fitted into the Japanese Hakuto R lander, along with NASA's Lunar Flashlight Probe. The mission marks the first time a commercial mission will land on the moon, but the pioneering doesn't stop there. Rashid is equipped with a machine learning algorithm, or what most people would commonly refer to as AI. This particular algorithm was programmed by a Canadian company called Mission Control Space Service. This mission is the first time that artificial intelligence has journeyed outside of low Earth orbit. Now, this is not a true AI, or what the industry often refers to as artificial general intelligence, and that means that the rover can't think for itself or perform advanced problem solving the way that a human brain can. But machine learning algorithms are an important step towards that end goal, and a tool that is increasingly being used to support automation. The basics are that the algorithm is built to learn by making guesses about what it's been told to do, collecting the feedback, and adjusting its guesses. Over time, the program evolves and gets fairly good at what it does, and more importantly, it doesn't have to be told to do this experimentation. This is why NASA in particular is so interested in the results of this test. Mission Control Space Services, or MCSS, have designed a system that will use machine learning to train a rover to make certain decisions without input from the ground, and the importance of this ability cannot be understated. The moon is a pretty close distance to Earth, relatively speaking, so a signal takes about 2.7 seconds to get to the moon and back, if the ground team doesn't need to use a relay. And while relay satellites are being put into place now to support the Artemis mission, there are sometimes larger delays when it comes to sending commands to robots on the moon. But the moon isn't our only objective. NASA and its partners have both active and planned robotic missions for Mars, the outer solar system, and even our first steps into other solar systems. The delay times range from about a half hour turnaround for Martian bound robots and upwards. The Voyager probes, our furthest ranging vehicles, take over 10 hours to send or receive a signal. So you can see why NASA is excited to see if they can get their rovers to start thinking for themselves, at least as far as their regular activities are concerned. AI machine learning is very much in its early stages of development right now, which is leading to some controversy when it's used to do things like making art or writing essays. This type of program needs to start somewhere, and so in the case of art creation, it needs to take art that has already been made by humans and play with that until it makes something that looks new. That's an understandably touchy subject in a creative field, but perfectly fine when it comes to scientific uses. In Rashid's case, the rover is being tasked with identifying minerals and types of geological formations. That's something the ground team can find images and spectrum analysis charts for and feed them into Rashid's program. Then all they have to do is just let the bot experiment. The more it fails, the faster it learns. And the best part is that this experimentation isn't just for the UAE or a private Canadian company. MCSS is working through the Canadian Space Agency here, which makes this a mission whose results will be freely given to anyone wanting to attempt the same AI-run operations in space. MCSS CEO Ewan Reed says that's why this demonstration with the Canadian Space Agency is nice, because it's very much in the public domain and we're allowed to talk about it. Rashid itself is only intended to run for one lunar day, about a month of Earth time. So this isn't intended to be a long-term mission. 
Rashid will land in April and have about a month to train itself to find and catalog minerals and formations before the moon turns and the little rover is cut off from the sun, eventually freezing and shutting down. In that time, Rashid will likely gather some of the most valuable data for future rover missions that we will see this decade. And considering this is the UAE's first rover mission, that's a hell of a mark to make on human spaceflight. On January 27th, satellite monitoring in low Earth orbit recorded a nightmare scenario. Two Soviet objects, a spent rocket stage and a defunct spy satellite, narrowly missed colliding with each other by a mere 6 meters. That's inside the 10 meter margin of error for our current measurement capabilities. That's the sort of close miss that gives astronomers nightmares. The whole thing was monitored by LEO Labs, a company that is dedicated to monitoring low earth orbit debris and debris fields for signs of collisions and potential problems like this scenario. A company post on Twitter confirmed that the near miss happened in an orbital area that is a bad neighborhood. This region has significant debris generating potential in LEO due to a mix of breakup events and abandoned derelict objects, end quote. But why is this such a hair-raising event? This event was a very close call, but typical distances between debris floating in orbit is usually measured in the kilometers, and companies like Leo Labs keep careful watch over this space trash, cataloging and calculating their trajectories and orbits so we can give advance warning to our crewed vehicles and stations. Well, the problem in this case is twofold, and it starts with a scenario called Kessler Syndrome. In 1978, NASA scientist Donald Kessler wrote that in time, the density of orbital garbage, satellites, vehicles, and stations would be so high that a collision would be inevitable. But the collision itself isn't the problem. Small ones, like the recent damage to Soyuz MS-22, are manageable. Any debris that sort of strike generates is too small to do much harm, and probably couldn't even be tracked. But as Kessler wrote back in the 70s, the larger strikes are what could produce a cascading effect. Debris crashing into other objects, creating more debris, on and on until there's a giant orbiting cloud of shrapnel, similar to the inciting incident in the movie Gravity. Leo Labs points out that the collision of just these two pieces of space trash could have created thousands of new debris fragments that would have stayed in orbit for decades. But a Kessler cascade shows that decades is a conservative estimate, with some models predicting a full cascade would mulch almost everything in low Earth orbit and cut us off from operating at that altitude for centuries. Now, that's not to say that we couldn't continue to launch rockets. There's still not enough debris to really cut us off from space completely, but it would make low Earth orbit way too dangerous to operate in, and we'd be forced to work further out. Luckily, we haven't reached the density predicted by Kessler yet, but the close call on the 27th is just one of many in the past couple of years. The most notable in recent years was a Russian anti-satellite missile test in February 2021 that despite warnings from the international community, destroyed an old military satellite, generating hundreds of thousands of new pieces of debris and forcing crew of the International Space Station to take emergency precautions more than once as the new debris cloud passed uncomfortably close. This event spurred action from governments all over the world, new legislation was drafted bringing decades old laws about space junk up to date, new restrictions were put into law to ensure any new satellites put into orbit must be deorbited inside 5 years or less, and a whole slew of companies with debris gathering projects like NanoRacks saw a big funding boost. It is a little upsetting that it takes imminent threats for us to start taking action on things that the scientific community has warned us about for decades, but it is also impressive to see how fast humanity can adapt and develop solutions. Nanoracks and their debris mitigating tests, Astroscale's magnetic chase satellites, and even the Airbus Harpoon equipped robot are just a few of the commercial and public programs designed to actively and passively change our orbital garbage situation. Hopefully, these efforts will start to make a dent in the heap, because after a 6 meter close pass, I don't know if the folks at Leo Labs can take much more excitement. 2023 is going to be a huge year for commercial partnerships with NASA, and Astrobotics Peregrine Lunar Lander will be one of the first in a wave of missions meant to prepare future Artemis mission landing sites. 
The Peregrine, which has been in development since 2018, has just cleared its final barrage of tests before getting the go-ahead to ship their vehicle to Florida, where it'll be loaded with 14 payloads, including 11 NASA experiments, and then fitted to the United Launch Alliance's Vulcan Centaur rocket for its debut launch. The Peregrine is designed along similar lines to the Japanese Hakuto landers, essentially ferries that move scientific payloads like rovers and instruments to their destination. It's part of a wider effort by NASA to begin leaning on commercial partners to create a wider support network for mainline missions like the Artemis program. It's called the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program, and it's NASA's way of ensuring they maximize their budget focusing on their big missions and letting commercial companies handle the peripheral work, like scouting landing sites and testing new technology, which is exactly Peregrine's mission. The lander is loaded with experiments designed to test the moon's atmosphere, which yeah, the moon doesn't really have a traditional atmosphere, but a complex array of magnetometers and spectrometers will be used to measure what the moon does have. Add to that a rangefinder, new solar panels, and other devices for surface measurement, and it seems like Peregrine is more of a tech demo than it is a focused science mission. But that's the best part about the CLPS program. Peregrine is just one of the many missions slated to head to the moon in the next couple of years. Intuitive Machines is also running missions for NASA's CLPS program, and will be launching five payloads to the moon this year alone. These missions will be scouting landing sites in various locations for upcoming Artemis crewed missions to the lunar surface, but they'll also be testing things like extracting drinking water from the lunar south pole. Using commercial groups to shore up the gaps in NASA's lunar plans is a pretty ingenious idea. There are a ton of talented teams of engineers not on NASA's payroll with a lot of interesting ideas. By leaning on these companies, NASA isn't just saving resources, they are fostering innovation that will only lead to faster technological development. So, we're looking forward to Peregrine's upcoming launch. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.